afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here at the East Asian Institute for a special seminar on Zoom. We're delighted to have Alicia Garcia Herrero uh, to talk us through something which is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, there is a war in the Ukraine, and the question is, what does it mean for the rest of the world? Of course, it means a lot of misery for people in the Ukraine and in Europe, and frankly, in Russia. But we are looking today at the economic consequences of it, and particularly for the largest economy in the region for China. And that uh, is a complex issue. And frankly, uh, it's an ongoing debate. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank still haven't brought up their new projections, but Alicia Garcia Herrero and Atixis have. So I took this opportunity to organize this special seminar and to have uh, uh, Alicia share her thoughts. Uh, Alicia Garcia Herrero is the Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at Natixis. She also serves as a Senior Fellow at the European Think Tank Bruegel. She's a non-resident Fellow at the Madrid-based political think tank Real Estucio El Cano. And, and I should emphasize that she's also a Senior Fellow of the East Asian Institute. Uh, she's currently adjunct professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and a member of the advisory board of Berlin-based think tank Merix. And she's also an advisor to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, a research arm and the ADB. And she's got a PhD from econo in economics from George Washington University. And in a very deep past, we also almost cross paths in Kiel at the Kiel Institute of, uh, of Economics. So without further ado, we hand over to Alicia. Please mute yourself. Um, later on, if you have questions, I'll give instructions on how to ask questions. Uh, if you want to ask questions through the chat, that is also fine. Uh, but with, uh, with that, I'll hand over to Alicia. Thank you for, for joining us, Alicia. Um, thank you, Bert. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I am not expecting or, or, or I don't think I it just might grow here in the light of what's going on in, in Ukraine because it's very hard or in the midst of it. But what I hope I can do today is to uh, look at the uh, risks, um, downward risks mostly. Um, uh, what, if, what if not? Because that's all we have. Uh, the degree of uncertainty is enormous. So I'm going to use some slides, not that the slides will answer all of the questions, but at least they will guide me through um, the ideas I want to uh, cover. And I would be very happy if you would stop me at any time with questions. I don't need to finish the whole thing. I'm, I'm happy to, to stop and continue if, if, if you have uh, issues you want to clarify, comment on, or, or even offer ideas. So here you go. The you. Russia-Ukraine conflict and the Chinese economy. That's that's the idea. So pre preliminary thoughts first. Uh, indeed, trying to um, go through you know the, the dynamics of, of what we are trying to do here. Uh, first of all, where the Chinese economy stand because this is not only about obviously the uh, the war in Ukraine, but but when is it coming uh, on the Chinese economy? And and I think that's important to to take into account. And then. The impact of the uh, of the crisis itself, or at least so far, because this is just the immediate uh, impact, and then it's slightly more like medium term, uh, related uh, to China's role in in the conflict, and, and, and that, that can of course um, very what? much responsible power. very much change the ultimate consequences of this crisis. Nice. So, um, I think, uh, I, yes, I think somebody's not muted, just... Uh, yeah, please, please, can you all mute? Uh, that would be very helpful. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. find who's not muted, but please mute. Yes, okay, thank you, Bert. So, so here you go. First, um, the channels. I think uh, to, to, to think of how this crisis is affecting China, I think the first and most obvious channel is uh, energy prices but also more generally scarcity of commodities, uh, potential disruptions in supply chain. All of those are the most in, kind of immediate um, uh, 
channels. Uh, I'm going to, however, talk about a few other channels, the financial channel, because we hear less about that. So I'll cover that uh, uh, in, in the presentation. And, and then, um, of course, the indirect channel, the, the sanctions. How do the sanctions uh, affect China directly? Less so for the time being, but indirectly through through China's uh, relations, trade and investment relations with Russia, and of course the voluntary uh, aspect of it, how uh, Western companies are reacting and what that might mean or what to learn from that, um, and then uh, the last point is China's positioning regarding the war in Ukraine and what that might be. So that's, those are the ideas, not that I've developed all of them in the presentation, but at least they will guide us in the discussion. So where are we starting from? Uh, I guess the, the government work report and Bert had a, a wonderful summary of it. So nothing that you don't know uh, in this slide probably, but I, I want to uh, complement what was said there, and this is just a summary with uh, a report, a very short report we wrote um, on the actual uh, space. So, so first of all, this growth rate, to my mind, is high. I still remember an article on the FT thinking it was low because you know they were look they were thinking of six percent before COVID, and this is lower. But this is this is clearly high, in my opinion, for where China is coming from, yeah, the, the rapid deceleration in, in 2021 and all of the uh, challenges, whether it's the real estate sector and, and you know, we had a, 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 an energy crunch in, in September or so last year. And, you know, we all know that there, there, there have been uh, quite a few challenges, one of which, um, and this is clearly stated in the uh, report, is the fiscal, um, the, the actual um use of the fiscal space they, they, they don't say there isn't any fiscal space but the fact is that it wasn't used last year and the idea is use it this year the number of the fiscal deficit doesn't really tell the story because it's even lower but we know uh, reading the report the transfer from the central bank uh, you know many many things that there will be more money available what we do in that little short report is to show that according to our calculations and this is all about um off balance sheet uh, calculations. So basically, LGFVs, uh, mainly LGFVs. Uh, we don't think that last year was a year where no, there was no fiscal expansion, actually. Uh, our estimates of this augmented fiscal deficit go all the way to uh, 12 point something. I can't remember the something, but it's a, it's a big one. And, and we therefore think that that it might be much harder than thought, uh, by the way, and with a very rapidly reducing effective tax ratio, which we now hear about, but the point is they've already done it. So they, they would have stopped around 12% according to our calculation. So just imagine how, how much more can you do? So I start there because this war is coming at a time where there is seemingly a lot of space, but I'm worrying that there's not so much space. And in fact, I, I just wrote a, an op-ed this, um, yeah, published this morning for the FT, making exactly that point, that the, that is not so much that uh, the pitch isn't there, so whether it's the work report, uh, et cetera, but how to actually execute it, that isn't very clear to me. The same is true for monetary policy. We just saw, if you look at the EPFR data, uh, China recorded the fastest and, and largest drop in capital inflows, literally on record, on portfolio flows and uh, in particular fixed, uh, fixed income flows. Why? Because the room isn't there anymore. You know, like, like we're seeing this with the BOJ, by the way, it isn't only China. It's very hard to diverge from the Fed very hard. And, and I think that makes the fiscal space, the, sorry, the monetary space, much less there than we might think it is. And this is important because this is when, uh, of course, the, the, the outflows might be related with the war, maybe not, maybe yes, maybe just the, the shrinking interest rate differential. But the point is that that's when the war hits. So the, the, my take here is that the room is not much 
for a very ambitious growth rate. And then you have on top of all of that COVID plus, of course, the war. Now, COVID. So this is our mobility index. Uh, for details as to how we calculate this, I would have to go to my team, but this is basically GPS data. Maybe some of you use this data. Um, I don't know, it's uh, quite readily available. And I think it's, it's important to, to kind of know where we are with COVID in terms of mobility. So what we have there is a, a mobility ratio that is uh, really moving very fast southwards um, at a speed similar to uh, early 2020. Of course, I'm not saying that we are there for obvious reasons, uh, but the picture shows that this is not a minor event and that um, uh, mobility is being, and this is all domestic mobility. We talked about uh, external mobility, we we'll probably have a very low mobility for a very long time, but, but here we're talking about domestic mobility. Now, in early 2020, what you have in this graph on online versus actual retail sales is that online sales helped a lot uh, in, in that uh, very sharp reduction in mobility. Uh, of course, uh, probably you know, concentrated more in, in, in a couple of provinces than it is the case today. But, but the point is that there was this uh, sudden uh, search in online um, re uh, retail sales, but that isn't happening anymore. So there isn't that kind of cushion of a change in, in, con in consumption model, if, if, I, if, if I may say. Um, I, I don't have many more graphs, but if you ask me why is consumption or at least retail sales uh, so weak in, in China, uh, I think the graph that to me is most uh, appealing, and it might be after this one, but I want to check uh, whether I finally included it. No, because I wanted to be brief on where we stand. It's actually disposable income to me. It's a very, very obvious um, pattern that, that explains that the disposable income is really not coming back to where it was before COVID. And, there's a number of reasons, and I'm sure you, some of you may know much better about employment data in China and so on. But to me, it shows that forget about employment da data because it's so much out of that. But disposable income is kind of what is happening across the board in um, uh, you know, uh, uh, many different households uh, showing that they don't have the ability to spend they used to have. And I think that's important to, to take into account. Now, uh, investment, where are we? Well, according to the most recent data, uh, we're in a boom. And to me, and again, I don't want to, to, to say that the data has issues because I'm nobody to say that, but it's just so strange. I mean, let's put it this way because the, 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 the base effect should actually push these growth rates very low because you, you have a, you know, this is January, February of, 2021 where you know that you were recovering from nowhere in January February 2022 so don't ask me why we have this very fast uh profits big investment uh, understand action from local government but the key is manufacturing investment that's where the boom coming from already a huge boom in the whole of 2021. This doesn't fit the data, of first electricity data, doesn't even fit the, um, the numbers we have for foreign direct investment in China in 2021, which is actually coming down uh, compared to 2022. So um, big question mark, uh, uh, but the key question here is March, what's happening in March? And there, what we know, is, I mean, we don't have much data. In fact, I was actually trying to get some uh, big, some of the big data we have. And actually, I just got it on the, on the chat. Um, so because we are actually publishing a report next week on exactly that, the using, uh, very, I mean, high frequency data to see what may happen in March in China. And we have like, for example, uh, movie uh, box uh, revenue uh, for 40 percent reduction uh here if i have my glasses i may actually 
uh, yes, this is home transactions. Um, but I wanted to see, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, steel uh, also coming down, uh, utilization rate. Uh, I mean, basically, uh, this is reflecting the shutdown intention. So what 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 I'm trying to say here is the following: that the data we have for January and February is weird. Uh, we have bad exports relative, fifteen plus. We have very good industrial profits. We have very good fixed asset investment, but but it doesn't really match the electricity data. Plus we have March, the, the, the black hole of March. And in March, we know that mobility has collapsed. So, so the first quarter data won't be very telling. I think the first quarter data won't tell us where China is heading this year. We need to look at March and look at whether both the war, and I'm going to get to that, and the pandemic, how these two things are affecting China. And uh, to that end, I think uh, for mobility, we need you know, high frequency indicators of consumption, blah, blah, blah. And for the world, we need to look at the, the you know, first sentiment, foreign investors, we just had huge capital outflows, as I mentioned. We need to look at uh, China's stand, we will talk, in, uh, talk about that, but that's basically the key here, that what, that the macro data we may be seeing now might not necessarily be uh, informative. And I, I want to really highlight uh, that um, because we may end up talking about the first quarter for a long time, <laughs> we economists, and that's not what the information is. So, um, sorry, I need to go back to the presentation. You might be seeing my screen now. Uh, I just realized that I'm sharing the screen. Apologies for that. Let me go back to where I was, which is uh, here, yeah? So now you can see the screen, okay. So, so Ukraine. So now we are basically saying that beyond Ukraine, we have COVID, we have, you know, outflows, maybe related, maybe not um, uh, very, poor within consumption in March and what else is coming. So, so the first thing to note is that Russia is not big for China. I mean, this is something uh, pretty obvious. Uh, Russia has the size of uh, uh, Spain as an economy and it just can't make a big difference. Not even if we were to see a big substitution of um, uh, Russian imports from Europe to China, which people talk about. Some of the imports are not substitutable. For example, pharmaceutical. I mean, it's not that everything that Europe exports to Russia can be exported by China. Uh, but even if that were the case, basically it would imply that, uh, I don't know, Chinese exports increase by, I don't know, half a percentage point. I mean, that's not going to change China's export uh, picture. Um, now, uh, many people ask me it, 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 the following question, is Ukraine going to change the, uh, the, inflationary, uh, the inflation outlook for the PBOC, and therefore making it harder to cut? For me, uh, the PBOC has, will have a hard time cutting, but not because of inflation. In my view, inflation in China will all be upstream producer prices. Uh, here I only have PP, uh, PPI, but if you look at upstream producer prices, they even hit, if I am not mistaken, my memory may not be, actually it's not very good, but something like 20 plus. That's where the bulk of the issue is. And what that means is the margin for manufacturers, at the basically serving end consumers, uh, will continue to shrink. This is a problem, not for inflation, but a problem for basically SMEs in China, uh, defaults, employment, more than inflation. Because uh, the lack of demand will be even more obvious because of uh, COVID waves. So, so to me, it's more like a, a, an even bigger wedge between uh, producer prices and consumer prices rather than an inflation uh, boom or, you know, like a, a inflation scare as in other parts of the world. Um, now uh, here, this graph is already showing the direction, uh, but we have more recent data and, and, and it's even worse. Um, 
it's a very, very large outflow. We're seeing already the renminbi starting to, you know, uh, clinch down uh, towards the more depreciated. I don't think that's an issue now because it's been very strong for two years. But the, the, the point is that it may be very large and very sudden. And I think the problem with this is not so much the renminbi as such, is the sense of, I mean, like, like why is this happening? Uh, the sense that COVID might not be under control, that Ukraine has, you know, is, is, is a global uh, shock. I mean, the, the kind of the, the reasons why we are having these outflows, I think that's, that's the key here, more than uh, necessarily only the impact on the exchange rate, et cetera. Moving to uh, the financial sector. So should we worry about the war and the Chinese banks' exposure? Well, uh, uh, this graph uh, could be read as yes, indeed, because they have the largest share of cross-border lending uh, into Russia compared to places that are already, you know, being pretty squeezed by the market when there is Austria or Italy, Italian banks. But actually, there is a trick in this graph. Uh, let me tell you, this is just the fact that uh, cross-border lending for Chinese banks is much smaller than it is for Italian banks or for Austrian banks. So in a way, Yes, it is relatively important. Uh, Russia is an important financial partner for, uh, for um, Chinese banks, especially policy banks and the largest uh, state-owned commercial banks, but, but they're not as exposed to the rest of the world as you know, European banks. So in that regard, the shock is smaller. But I just wanted to note that within uh, their exposure, Russia is actually more important uh, than, uh, than it would be for so it's about 32 billion. Um, and this is commercial cross-border lending. I'll show you in a minute um, other types of lending. So for example, this is another channel. Yeah, that uh, again, some clients ask uh, what, what's going to happen to Singapore or to Hong Kong, yeah? And there you find that actually the, the, the size of, China, of Russian banks it says, or, or corporations actually is very, very small. Uh, a little bit bigger in the syndicated loan market in, in Singapore because of commodities. Very small in Hong Kong. You only have Brussel in, in the Hang Seng. It's, it's just very, very small. But anyway, um, I thought I should mention that. And um, uh, this is exactly what you see in, in this graph that on syndication uh, loans is really a new thing post uh, Crimea. So Asia didn't exist for Russian corporations before Crimea, but it started to exist after Crimea. But bear in mind that the biggest is either ruble, so you see there in gray, so Russia, so domestic, uh, or London, but it's not Hong Kong, it's not Singapore. This is good for Asia um, because the, uh, the biggest financial uh, spillover is on Europe. It's not uh, uh, here. With the exception, though, of, as I said, um, some exposure of, of Chinese banks, whether through the syndicated loan market you have here, but as you see, after COVID, it really went down very aggressively. This, just to give you a sense of dimension, is what the AIB has lent to Russia. If it, you know, I say that because, of course, AIB uh, froze the... Uh, I am not sure whether they froze the existing loans, to be frank, but certainly new loans. And there was a pending loan uh, to be approved for Russia. I checked that in their web and a couple for Belarus. But the amounts are small. Belarus is a couple of hundred million dollars. And uh, I think Russia something like a billion left. So... But as you see here from the syndication, it's, it's small. What is slightly bigger is development finance. So this is basically policy banks. Um, uh, um, Exim, oh, sorry, uh, is it me? No. Sorry, I, give me, the, let me a second because I don't have any phone. Uh, is it me ringing or? No, it's somebody else. Uh, I'm happy to, to know that because I was worried. Anyway. Um, but project finance is big, uh, as you can see there, um, um, because of the big, uh, of, of basically part of Siberia one, this is about the 60 billion project already uh, finalized. And, and this is really where the bulk of the lending from China to Russia stands. So it's, it's 
policy banks mainly, not commercial uh, lending. Uh, what that means for those humongously large banks is probably not, you know, too relevant. And 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 the fact that you know they don't comply with the same with the same uh, regulatory standards in terms of you know whether it's uh, capital, etc., or provisioning probably makes it a non no major event for them. So now we so from from so we're what I'm trying to kind of wrap up here is that the financial channel is not big, the commercial channel is not major. The what really matters for the Chinese economy now, if, if we if we abstract from China's role in the in the crisis, if we abstract from the geopolitics of it, uh, and you know, assuming that China complies with the sanctions and there's no 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 playing around with that, I think the impact basically is as big as it would be uh, for the global economy. In other words, exports might of course weaken because the global economy is doing worse, but nothing special uh, for China. That that would be my my my. That, that that in itself is uh, good news for the for the only reason that there's so many other things happening in China that are worrisome, whether it's COVID or you know the stock market, the the, the crackdown, the blah blah blah. I mean, many things that that we need to take into account, and the difficulty to reach that growth target uh, with with what I consider to be rather limited fiscal and monetary space. Uh, but but the the that way to look at Ukraine, which is really direct impact, is not the full story, unfortunately. The elephant in the room is how the rest of the world uh, perceives, because I'm not even going to talk about what China really wants, because I guess by now nobody fully, fully knows. I mean, it's like, you know, we, we hear A, B, C, and we're all confused. But but it is really about how the rest of the world perceives what China wants. And you know that, that's a big statement because by now it doesn't only depend on China. And I think that's why this issue is, is extremely important. It, on top of that, we can't really say, okay, this thing ends uh, the day that you know, we have a, a peace agreement or or whatever resolution or no it doesn't because even when you uh, you are there uh, there may be you know a government in exile or or a russia that becomes extremely anti west and you know with other problems i mean it's not going to end the day that so the duration the depth and the expansion of this issue let alone the uh, duration, depth, and expansion of the sanctions is something that will be crucial in the consideration of, of uh, the ultimate impact for China. Uh, it, so so I, what I'm trying to say here is that sometimes I feel, and, and I include myself, that we look at this in a very narrow way, yes, CIPS, uh, blah, 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 but actually it's much more complex because this is going to be literally uh, for better or worse expression, a new global order in the sense that this is going to stick with us for a long time and China will need to sit on this for a long time. And, and, and that's where structural changes, and we've learned this from um, COVID, by the way, start to kick. Um, so, uh, so it's about long-term economic relations uh, between the US, Europe, and China, uh, let alone China and Russia, China and Ukraine in that order, I guess. Um, so um, to me, the most likely scenario, and you know, I'm saying nothing new here, <laughs> literally nothing new, is that China will abide to the letter of the law. I mean, we have a lot of signals of this, yeah, from aircraft parts, from LCs, from uh, Chinese banks, basically, I mean, Chinese banks cutting their LCs to, for Russian banks. Um, or Russian operations. So to me, it seems clear that no matter the narrative, uh, China will comply because it's just too costly. And they learn from, you know, Huawei City just finished a case in, in the US. I think, you know, it's very obvious. It's just too, too messy. And the idea that the US is after us kind of will make it even more compelling. So to me, that's clear. But I also think that China will, will use the room available 
uh, with the spirit of the law. And, you know, we hear all kinds of stories from uh, the Chinese ambassador in, in Russia, and, you know, the kind of the, the um, uh, recommendations offered to the private sector, Chinese private sector there, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that idea of, I use the room I have. Now, this room will shrink because we're heading there. There's going to be some kind of secondary sanction. Even without that, we have the issue that uh, Sullivan said this very clearly while in Brussels, um, I think while in Brussels, at least last, I mean, this week that is ending now, that uh, sanctions uh, apply to China. G7 sanctions apply to China. And I think what that, I mean, one interpretation of that to me is, for example, uh, semiconductors. Yeah, semiconductors, we know that this is a big issue for the Russian army and beyond, but certainly for the Russian army. So the question is, what if components of semiconductors sent to China from, I don't know, Samsung or TSMC or you name it, uh, end up, you know, being exported through SMIC's um, assembly uh, to Russia? So the possibility that, that the US come back comes back and uh, looks at the way it designed the sanctions for China, entity list, uh, military related sanctions, you name it, is very easy to just say, okay, I expand this to whatever you do with Russia. So my sense is that uh, that fine line of the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law is going to shrink. And, by, and, and that making a choice from China's side increasingly compelling because without that, you just can't walk this fine line. Um, so, you know, uh, we've talked a lot and I'm going to basically end very soon uh, about the financial space. So, so imagine that because of uh, uh, secondary sanctions, because now it's rather easy. I mean, you can even uh, operate even in hard currency because there are no full commercial sanctions as long as you don't touch the the, uh, the Ministry of Finance, the Central Bank and a number of institutions, but others you could do. And I think there's still a lot of room, but the question is, if there isn't, uh, what can China offer? And there, of course, we know about CIPS or even the, in the EEC and Y. My sense of these uh, offers uh, is that, first of all, uh, Russia is outsmarting these offers <laughs> just by asking to be paid in ruble. I mean, like, like it, to me, it's very clear that these offers aren't so appealing because Russia is already looking for other offers. It's actually creating its, a swap line with India uh, to be paid in, in Indian rupee, which makes... Uh, you know, importing uh, oil and uh, oil at a much uh, at, at a big discount uh, from India plus the rupee, a, a big deal. I mean, a wonderful deal. So, so, but why is uh, Russia doing this? Is because Russia doesn't want to depend only on China. This is very obvious to me because of the the responses, the strategies that Russia is is coming up with, and and the reason is that. In a way, CIPS is a little bit of a deadlock because first it runs through SWIFT, uh, second, uh, it doesn't have the enough liquidity. I mean, the same with the uh, ECNY. I mean, why would you, if you have a weak uh, ruble and you're already trying to avoid the dollarization or or at least informal dollarization of the economy by, by, surround, by obliging to surrender all of the dollars to the central bank, then you accept you know, a, a non-convertible currency that circulates all over the place that you don't control to make your ruble even weaker with something you cannot even, you know, like, it, I don't think that's what Russia is uh, looking for. Thus, this, the potential solutions that, or at least partial solutions or a respite that, that China may offer are not as appealing. Uh, I think what China has to offer is like the medium term. I mean, like, like once this ends, um, uh, by the way, I want to say that, and I, I would love to hear uh, your comments on, on the reserves. So what we know is that there's, of course, about 90 billion in uh, equivalent US dollar at the PBOC. They're not at the PBOC. I always hear they're at the PBOC, but they're not because these are liabilities. These, these are sovereign bonds that actually anybody can sell. Yeah, I mean, anybody literally can sell. And you may have heard that part of the 
the sell-off before the outflows were obvi very obvious to all of us from the data uh, portfolio outflows. But before that, we saw a, a spike uh, in the three years sovereign in China and people thought these were Russian selling uh, their bonds, rightly so. So far, I mean, selling the bonds is, is, is a no brainer. But the question is, what do you do with those renminbi? Where do you deposit them? And there's also a very interesting increase in renminbi deposits in Hong Kong, only in Hong Kong, not in Singapore, not, not anywhere else. Um, so do you then transfer the renminbi overseas? So you don't swap them into dollar because once you swap them into dollar, that's where the PBOC appears in the picture. So what I'm trying to say is that the PBOC can help uh, or at least uh, there's no need, I would say, for the PBOC to help unless they offer the dollars. And the question is, would that be uh, going against the sanctions? Uh, yes or no? I guess yes, because this is a sanctioned entity. But I think it's the point here, that just even this very simple point, is to, to basically show that it's not so much that uh, Chan has like the answer and, and can just and solve this issue. It isn't really like that. It's much more complex. What Russia needs, China might not have fully, not in the short run, at least, maybe in the medium run. And this is the conclusion really is that uh, the Chinese economy is struggling, um, in my opinion, and you can sense uh, Liu He's uh, pitch is very clear to me as, as a sense of, you know, I need to react to what's going on. Uh, this is not because of Ukraine only. I mean, let's let's be frank. I don't think Ukraine is the bulk of, of the issue here. It's more uh, Chinese the Chinese economy before the wave, COVID wave, and even more so during uh, this wave. And and then Ukraine is an add-on. I think that if, if if there were not to be any geopolitics and China could kind of not show its face, meaning not be in the spotlight, I think the impact could be rather limited, no more than anywhere else. The problem is that China is in the spotlight. And I think that a fine walk, the um, fine line that China needs to walk uh, between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law is going to be increasingly difficult. Um, and at some point, uh, China might need to, to, to take certain decisions. Plus, uh, worse than that, even if China wanted to help, it's not going to be very easy because there's this idea, and I, I write it here, the impossible trinity, that China, yes, uh, needs to comply with sanctions, and needs to, wants to support Russia, but doesn't want to, to worsen the relations with the West. So this, this is just literally impossible. <laughs> so something needs to give. and. Given the situation of the Chinese economy, one, in, you know, logically speaking, would say, oh, my God, Russia needs to give because, you know, the West so far is much more important. But we're not seeing that. And really here, I leave it with a question mark open to everybody in this seminar. Why? Why are not we uh, seeing that given the state of affairs of the Chinese economy? Unless you disagree and you think that the Chinese economy is in great shape, which uh, I would very much like to hear and debate about. So that's all from my side. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, clearly, the objective of stability for this year is uh, has a lot of upsides for China at the moment. Uh, it's your analysis basically says that the direct impact will remain limited, either financial or uh, uh, commercial uh, through goods trade. Uh, but that is a big, a big um, problem hanging over China that what if they transgress on the sanctions. Now, now is that, let me take the first question and anybody who wants to ask a question, please use your virtual hand, but also switch on your camera because then we can actually see you. So you have a reactions button. There is a yellow hand there that you can raise. Uh, please do if you have a question. But my first question is, what we've seen in capital outflows is that more the domestic side, the, 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 the downward mood before Liu He's intervention saying that he's going to save Alibaba and Tencent. I think that's what he said. Uh, or is it 
already anticipating people positioning themselves in the fear of China being caught in the sanctions web. What, what's your take? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, we rely, uh, we have a number of different data points we're using for a report that, that, first of all, there is an existing report that I recommend everybody to read by the IIF. Uh, where they make this point that you know outflows are mm, record high. I mean, and uh, these are portfolio flows, mainly fixed income. But we have more data. I mean, uh, maybe the IF also has more data, but my point is that we are now looking into micro data uh, with the team to better understand, um, I mean, uh, so, First of all, as you probably know, it's very hard to know who is living in, in because of the type of data we have for holdings of bonds and also, you know, the, the, the actual sell and buy. And, and I think, you know, Michael Taylor is here, so he, he might have more, more detail on this. But what I can see from the data we're using is that... Um, so we have gross data. This is the first thing to say. We have inflows and we have outflows, and then we have the net outflows. Uh, the inflows have um, really stopped. So, so, so there is one issue, which is that people are not coming to China. It's not so much that everybody is leaving; is that people are not coming. Um, the EPFR data has a week, about a week delay, some or a week or ten days. So, so it's hard to tell whether this, this will change thanks to Liu He. But we're already seeing in the market that the impact was so far short-lived because we're seeing you know, uh, that the bull market didn't last very long. This was indeed uh, what I wrote about um, in this FTPs. And I think the reason is that, uh, okay, let me go very quickly to the Liu He thing, is that he promised a few things. He promised, uh, I will deal with the US, with the SEC, and don't worry about that, and it will accept the uh, internal audit, and that will be solved. Uh, on the kind of rule of law for internet companies in China, I'm afraid, I don't know how much he controls. I mean, you, you surely have a much better insider information than me. Uh, does he control the cyberspace? Space uh, administration of that. I mean, who controls that? I mean, can he really make sure that that, that there's no more interference? Um, uh, antitrust, same issue. I mean, I'm not sure that's fully under control. And the other one is the stimulus. This, and, and the real estate sector, which is another point that he makes. Uh, we're seeing that everybody's running, yeah? We're seeing banks seizing uh, basically deposits from Evergrande so that uh, they, they, they can hang on to, to reduce their losses and the bond, bondholders are screaming. You know, like it doesn't look like a very stable, uh, put it this way. Um, so if I'm a foreign investor and I know that my, the three-year uh, uh, yield differential used to be close to 300 basis points at the max, uh, but about 100 uh, only a few months ago. Now it's below 50. I mean, you're saying why? I mean, plus the renminbi, there's nobody thinking it's going to appreciate massively, is it? I mean, the Fed is going to do six, seven hikes. I mean, why would you? So be, so why why come come and jump on the market? Maybe you, you will not sell desperately and leave, but you will not come. I think a lot of what's happening is that foreign investors are not coming from the data I saw. Uh, that's all I can say, uh, Bert, sorry. Well, that's fine. Uh, I'm just gonna make your life a bit more difficult now because okay. the politics plays a big role. And I'm sure you have made an assessment of the politics to see to what extent that affect the economics. And the one could be, as you say, a very quick peace agreement and then some remedial measures and uh, China will, will be able to maintain its current political stance, basically uh, what, what Evan Feigenbaum said, pro-Russia neutral. Uh, but what if things go worse in the Ukraine? Uh, what do you think 
is the political atmosphere, will already, even with a neutral stance, will China be hit by, even if not sanctions, but at least by investor sentiment? That's one question. On the opposite side, or the opposite side, is there an upside? Is there a course of action that you believe China can take that would make uh, it more investable from a political point of view? And have you thought that through? Difficult yeah. questions. I know you may not have the answer, but I would like love to hear your thought yeah. process. Sure. Well, I love difficult questions because uh, in a way, that's the only way to think uh, things through. Um, so, uh, okay, first of all, I think a pro-Russia neutral position is costly for China. It's not a comfortable position. Uh, why is China there? Uh, I think the reason why China there is that uh, the outcome of uh, a defeated Russia is too hard for China to swallow. I think uh, a defeated Russia in the light of, you know, uh, I don't know, like a Navalny type, you know, coming and, and eventually becoming um, the new president or, or uh, of the Russian Federation. Um, would be extremely mm, difficult uh, for China. And I think that's the thing is that it's like, it's a little bit, although it is, unre I mean, not related, but it's the idea of the status quo. I mean, if China could choose, the choice would be the status quo. The problem is that we cannot go back to pre-Ukraine uh, situation. Um, but certainly not uh, an outcome that uh, evolves into a different Russia. So I think, it, and, and there's a number of reasons uh, beyond the uh, loneliness, if I may say, of uh, that China may feel in that idea of, um, of uh, changing the global order. There's also the issue of, of uh, uh, energy security, let alone military security and the complementarity of the two in terms of uh, military capabilities. So, so this is the thing, is that you are trying to avoid an outcome, maybe unlikely, but the point is that outcome is so uh, unappealing for China that the whole thing, you know, like is drawn out of that outcome you want to uh, avoid. Um, and so, so can it get worse? Yes, it can get worse. And it can get worse in several ways. Uh, one is if, put the into ways if Putin really can't make it and you know there's some signals I don't know how reliable they are that that it's not being very easy at the moment um China might be forced again because we go back to that ultimate objective to entertain some kind of help I have to say that the West is not helping because the West is uh, bragging literally about the military help is, is you know offering to Ukraine. So, so China could say, wait a minute, you are doing it. Why on earth can't I do it? I'm not threatening you because you are doing it. So, so you know, it in a way it's making it palatable for China to end up there, which is a risk, as we all know. Uh, the other reason might be less uh discuss or at least i feel that it, it is not so much in the you know at the center of the conversation is that putin i mean uh, as as a good uh, kgb uh, agent you know a ex agent i guess uh, um probably knows quite a lot about xi jinping and you know and you name it yeah i mean i one thing that i was surprised about again like sitting in taipei now is that Suddenly, I see this leak from the Russian military intelligence uh, mentioning that they knew that uh, they knew that, you know, there was that uh, they had evidence, something like that, uh, that uh, uh, China was uh, planning to attack Taiwan in the autumn. And, and now this happened exactly when uh, the U.S. came to uh, you know, uh, um, make public that uh, there were, they had some evidence, and also the Europeans, by the way, that China might be ready to help. I, I can't remember whether ready to help or helping, but the point is, that's when you get this thing from the Russian, and, and then you say, wow, 
I just cannot imagine that what Putin probably ha has in store that might push China even reluctantly, because this is something we forget that, that, that it might not even be just a decision. It might be the fear of something else that, 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 that Putin actually has in his hands. And that makes uh, Bert the possibility of a mistake, or if, no, I don't know if a mistake, but basically China moving from being in a bind to being binded, <laughs> or you know, much more likely than we probably think. It's, it's a very uh, difficult, uh, and how costly this would be, I think uh, very clearly um, would have uh, targeted sanctions targeted targeted maybe i mean i don't know very much about singapore sanctions i just read an article on the news i'm sure you're experts on that but what i read is that singapore sanctions were very targeted and they were um, very clearly specifying whatever relates to uh, the military uh, sector in russia so 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 this already could give some hints what if, so we target we sanction china for whatever relates to the military in Russia. But you know, that's a very difficult concept. And it can go all the way to what we saw with the military related companies, which ended up having all kinds of companies <laughs> inside. So um, yes, I think this is a high risk. I, I think I've not answered the second question because I was too long. That's and perfect. I probably missed. Um, yeah, but, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the, I'm the gonna... upside. Yes, sorry, uh, one minute, the upside is simple China is doing it now, the upside is uh, I'm um, I'm leading the south I'm leading the south you west your sanctions are destroying everybody else you west are you know and I'm leading the south and you south bear in mind that you may not have bread because of the west you may not have I mean uh, all the way to Saudi yeah I mean this is um, planned visit uh, to MBS um, with what that entails for the US, India, uh, South Africa already saying, um, you know, uh, I mean, this idea of non-alignment, I think is very much pushed by China as a way to show the West that you are what X percent of the population, you're nobody, and you're creating this thing compared to, you know, the rest. So it's a question of who isolates what, uh, whom, and I think China has been very smart to to basically get more, more and more on board of this idea of the South. Yeah, the global South. I, I see uh, Yusuf Wanandi in the room, and maybe he should start booking some uh, some room in uh, the Bandung for the Bandung conference on the global South, the non-aligned movement revamped. Uh, I would like to. Um, uh, Roland van den Brink has a question. He uh, he's not on the screen, so I presume that he doesn't want to ask it live. So let me ask it uh, for him. What is the most important index to track as an indicator that things would be derailing? When do we know when things go wrong? Everybody great seems to be question. focusing on the downside, but... Uh... Yes, a great question. Well, I I need to check this index. Um, sorry, my ignorance. I I don't think I've ever checked it, but I've checked uh, strategic, um, strategic uh, reserves of uh, wheat in China. Uh, yeah. Like... Uh, kilogram of wheat compared to one fourth for Europe. I mean, uh, the fact that many commodities also. Uh, Alicia, Alicia, you break, uh, you're break, are that, you're, you're are breaking up a little bit. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the fact that a lot of food in food are at peak and were at their peak before the Ukraine war started. And I, I'm not saying that that shows that China knew. It's not about that. I think China knew that we were in a very difficult situation globally. <laughs> I leave it there. For what's the reason, whether it's Ukraine, Taiwan, uh, the US containment, I 
doesn't really matter. The point is that they clearly knew that uh, that we probably hadn't hit the worst. It could be also COVID, if you think about it. I mean, the fact that the, they knew that they, they wouldn't reach um, a herd immunity anytime soon. I mean, it could be any, any story. But the point is that points to a very, very uh, shaky and poor situation, because that's when you create and you keep all of those strategic reserves, yeah? So um, I'll check out yours, but I think I wanted to say that I do think um, China was fully aware of the difficulties even before uh, Ukraine, the Ukraine war started. Uh, we have another, we only have difficult questions today, and that's and that's yes. probably, that reflects where we are. But uh, Plam and Tonchev has a great question. So could it be that China is really, well, they're struggling with different priorities, economic, domestic, political, and, and geopolitical. But could it be that the geopolitical imperative gets the upper hand over economic pragmatism? So no matter what the cost, in other words. Mm. Could it be that China would rationally decide in the end to side with Russia? Yeah, well, that's my, I, I mean, I didn't want to unveil my a priori because it looks a little bit dogmatic. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I was trying to look- You're in, in Taipei, right? You're in Taipei. Yes, but I agree with that. I think this is just too important, at least, at least until uh, the end of the year. Uh, because of the implications for for Xi Jinping's own reappointment, I don't think Xi Jinping can suddenly change um, his narrative. And I think that's so important that even if it may look irrational, it might have a rational that is not necessarily economic. Right. And also the big is like a lottery. I mean, you go to the casino and you play on one number, but that number makes you rich. Because if uh, mm, the result of the Ukraine war is to really change the global order, that's a magnificent price, you know, if, if you think about it for, for China. And therefore, um, I actually think that, that they will continue on that fine line pro-Russia uh, uh, um, kind of, um, it's hard to say neutrality because it isn't really fully neutrality. It's like, I would call it pro-Russia acceptance. I mean, pro-Russia, pro, uh, I mean, you re reluctant accept, pro-Russia reluctant acceptance of the others from a declining West, <laughs> that's what it is. So I accept your sanctions, I have no choice, but the minute I can get out of here, you'll see. I mean, that's what it is. So so it isn't so irrational. I agree, I fully agree with that comment. It's interesting. The, um, I mean, there is one upside and that uh, one upside scenario would be that China says, yes, we want to change the world order, but not the way Russia is doing it. and. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be the junior partner in this thing. And so Xi Jinping picks up the phone and says, okay, Putin, mm -hmm. just do as if we did in Vietnam, declare victory and say that we taught the Ukraine a lesson in withdrawal. And then China can have a big upside. They can show how the new world order would look like. I'm not sure, that, I mean, for investors that would may not, maybe not that impressive, but at least it would save, uh, uh, it would, maintain, uh, a, 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 if you want, one world order rather than a, world, uh, than a, a, a Cold War too. But that's just a remark from my side. We have a question from uh, a hey, very... A very uh, Before you ask the question, let me, let me come back to you on, on this uh, thing you said, because I think it's very important. I think what you are uh, proposing, for sure, uh, China would like that to, I mean, like a quick end and, and having a kind of half victory, but then you rewrite history and it becomes full victory kind of thing. But my only concern is what that means for Taiwan. That That's my, I mean, for China to push that with Putin, I think China needs to know whether that would be a solution for her for China, maybe not her, his, I don't know, <laughs> uh, uh, with Taiwan. And I don't have a clear, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, it, 
would that be enough? It's, because we're already there in Taiwan. I mean, China needs more than that, yeah? So, so we, would that create a precedent, in other words? Uh, uh, so, so my point is here, there is like a double head for uh, China. One is Ukraine, and the other thing, what that means for Taiwan. Let me remind you that Wang Yi spent, I don't know how many speeches explaining that Ukraine was not Taiwan, but the latest was why Ukraine was China, which to me was like, wait a minute, I, I'm lost with this one. And the whole idea was that sovereignty, if you're defending with your own arm, you know, the minute that I need you to defend my sovereignty, will you do the same you're doing with Ukraine? Which is kind of interesting how you, you know. So, um, so that's the thing that whatever they propose needs to fit their narrative with a different conflict. And that makes it even harder. I, I, I would welcome any perspective on these very big issues from uh, a lot of the smart people in the room. It doesn't have to be a question, just a contribution to the debate would also be welcome. But before that, I go to my very old friend, uh, Bert Keidel, another Bert, Albert Keidel, uh, who well woke up at a very, very impossible time. I don't know whether Bert wants to come live on screen. I saw him on screen before. If you switch on your camera, we can see you. If not, I'm going to ask your question. I'm still on. I'm still online. I mean, I'm still visible. I there you go. You. No, well, like so, somehow you're probably on a different screen. Oh, there you are, uh, Bert. Why don't you ask your question? Very nice to see you. Nice to see you, Bert. Thank you. Well, mine is just a sort of a simpleton question that uh, China's GDP growth averaged 5.1 percent over two years from 2019 to 2021, and so it's not a big leap to 5.5. And China has a lot of flexibility in, in expanding its fiscal space if it wants to and uh, working with its uh, financial uh, options. So why, why is 5.5 just a, a long reach for you, Alicia? Well, uh, it's a good point, Albert. In fact, I still have 5.2 since I, that number, I think is like 40 months old or something. So uh, on the basis that, uh, that um, we would see a deceleration because, you know, for me, the, the, the point here is 6.1 in 2019. I'm forgetting about this strange average, yeah, because the 5.1 average hides many things, yeah, in the heights, like humongous collapse, and then like every country in the world. So if I abstract from that average and I look at uh, the 6.1, I, I felt 5.2 was a uh, faster deceleration, but there are reasons for faster deceleration. Yeah, the real estate sector. So I felt comfortable with that. Why I'm now thinking I'm getting a little bit nervous is first because the, the, the leadership sounds nervous to me. I mean, in many ways, yeah. I mean, you, you literally ended the, 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 work, rep, uh, the work report, uh, the two sessions, and suddenly you have basically speaking like Draghi as to, you know, what you would need to do. Like, it sounds worrisome, number one. Number two, I think their external environment is much worse than it was in 2019, by all means and purposes. A lot of the growth last year... Oh, you're breaking up, Alicia. So you need to show the external demand. I'm breaking up. Yeah, you're, you're back, but you're, you're a little, mm -hmm. you're a little shaky. Uh, line, but I don't know where. Uh, okay, uh, what I'm going to do, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn off the video because it might help. I'm sorry about that. If, if it gets better, uh, I can turn it on. Uh, okay, so what I was saying is that um, the, a lot of the growth last year was coming from the from external demand. Then, of course, we had a very negative second half because of the real estate sector, actually with negative fixed asset investment for that very important sector, about a third of China's growth and about a third of fixed asset investment. So, yes, just a recovery of that sector could make it. Yeah. The problem is that as we move on and no matter the announcement, no property tax, no blah, 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 we still see basically a, a huge, I mean, it's like a long list of developers uh, waiting, literally, I mean, already uh, uh, either on grace period or beyond the grace period, not paying bondholders. Um, 
uh, unfinished units. You know, I don't see that that sector, no matter the mantra that it will be fine this year, but I just can't see how it's going to be fine. And beyond that, COVID. Uh, last year, the average mobility was pretty good, except uh, right before Chinese New Year. This year, as if we continue like this, we're going to have half of the uh, half of the year uh, with very low mobility, very very poor retail sales. So that so March, April, um, so so you need a consumption oriented stimulus, which China isn't very good at. I mean, I'm not saying it's not good at, but they don't have. They they could be very good at it. It's just they don't have the channels. Yeah, I mean, you, you, they do these lotteries to. I mean these vouchers and is, that's not really a, a very effective way to to promote consumption so because of all of those reasons i think the the target is becoming and and the and the war and the war i mean the, the, if, if we're talking about china but that, but europe i mean we we had 4.1% growth for europe europe is the second largest uh, trading partner for china uh, the eu and uh, growth will probably be less than half. So, you know, I, I feel that that there's a lot of things that aren't going into the upside, but rather the, the downside. And when uh, Li Keqiang came up with this target, my impression is that those factors were not as pressing as they are today, whether it was uh, COVID or even the war. All right. Uh, I. Uh... I have my views on it, but I'll, I'll hold back. Um, just for information, if you want, the reason I didn't see Bert Keidel was that he didn't raise his yellow hand. If you raise your yellow hand, then you come to my first screen. Otherwise, I would have to look for you. So if you have a question, put on your camera and raise your yellow hand in the reaction function. Uh, the one who did that very well is Dr. Yu Hong. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. This is Yu Hong uh, with East Asia Institute. Uh, I have a question uh, for you. As for the bilateral trade, right, between China and Russia, uh, can you assess the possibility of doing barter trade? This is not a creative idea, right? Actually, historically speaking, both countries have very substantial barter trade, right? Especially, you know, in the border town, right, back to the 1990s, right? Like the China's land port of Manjoli, right? So, you know, to circumvent, right, the sanction or secondary sanction, you just talk a lot, right, during your presentation. So uh, is that possible, you know, to import energy products or agricultural products from Russia? Maybe China can just easily export the industry goods, right? For example, the clothes, shoes, right, equipment or home appliance to Russia, which China needed, right? They cannot get from the West, right? So what is the idea, right? So can you assess this possibility? Maybe both countries have maybe soon will come to agreement on this. Thank you. Uh, well, yes, I mean, there's many ways to continue cooperation without touching the dollar. One is, of course, the renminbi. We know that there's a swap line, I think it's 140 billion um, equivalent US dollar between the two central banks. We have, I mean, there's many ways that they can use barter. It, I, I don't think that I mean, as you know, there's two contracts signed uh, in Beijing. One is, uh, is, is actually a small pipeline and the other one, Power of Siberia 2, is uh, going through, uh, well, basically joining the West pipelines, West going West and, and Power of Siberia 1, which would, in fact, create the possibility to have much more gas sold to China rather than Europe. But... Bear in mind that China today pays one fourth uh, um, per cubic meter than Europe. Uh, and this is because uh, China financed the part of Siberia one. So all of the gas that comes from part of Siberia is kind of subsidized. This is a very big contract that Russia and China signed this 400 billion uh, contract in gas in 2014 or 15. So, so I'm not saying all of that is not possible, but I'm saying Russia doesn't have a strong interest because the minute that it's only China, as you said, it's going to be barter, no money. I mean, barter, fine, but you know, like it's barter. I mean, from Russia's perspective, it's not like the first uh, best, is it? It's, it's just because there's no other option. 
So this is why Russia is coming with alternative options, whether it's paying in ruble, whether it's you know diversifying into India, whether because Russia doesn't want to be cornered in in these options you just mentioned. They are like all like I would say last options rather than first options. Yeah. We got a, a, a very intriguing and challenging question again from Gary Ang. Uh, Gary, would you like to ask it live? All right, if not, um, I'll read it out. China will need to delay the military option for Taiwan until they find a credible solution to Western sanctions, including against the People's Bank and US dollar reserves. Uh, if so, do you think that China will accelerate the internationalization of the RMB, including via uh, digital yuan, and basically removing its capital controls, which is necessary for that internationalization? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, there are two parts. First, do I think that China will delay military option for Taiwan? Uh, everybody thinks, uh, I guess the fact that I'm sitting here, I should agree <laughs> with, this, with this hypothesis. Otherwise, you know, I should be packing by now. But, but the point is that as much as I want to agree, I still have a question mark. And the question mark is, what do you do when you're cornered? Because, you know, as we move closer to the to the reappointment of President Xi, we, we could have a scenario where you have a full-fledged wave, COVID wave, you know, with, with not, not only one death as we have had so far, but quite a few more. We could have uh, uh, Putin in trouble and having to support him because otherwise Russia turns and there is protests in, in Russia. I mean, we had, what if you're already in St. Petersburg and you just don't want to see that. and. You know, and as you move on, you wonder, well, I mean, what can I do? I mean, what, what is uh, ultimately absolutely uh, consensual that, 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 I mean, among Chinese people, I'm not saying that everybody would agree, but I'm saying, they, I'm just putting myself in his, if I may, um, in, in his, you know, in his situation. And therefore, I'm not even sure that we can actually think that no matter the cost, because, you know, what we're learning from Russia is, yes, uh, the sanctions are tremendous, but but would the West impose such sanctions to China? Maybe not, because China is so much bigger. And we're already having difficulties to impose the sanctions on Russia. So so the, the reading, I mean, uh, your reading of what's happening is understandable, but it might not be necessarily the reading of the leadership because they may think they're much stronger. They may think that the West is starting to back down, back, up, back off because they can't change the course of things. I mean, the reading could be very different in a week, much more positive for Russia. We don't really know. Therefore, I'm not sure. But, but what I want to say is that I don't think that China's, uh, China is ready to, um, to uh, to really uh, open, to, to eliminate uh, capital controls, let alone now, no way. I think China's model of RMB internationalization is one that, bef that puts uh, in question the Western model of reserve currency, which is based on, on um, uh, full convertibility. Uh, I think the idea behind is when you have blockchain and you have a centralized ledger and you know every single movement, you can maybe on paper have full convertibility, but you can stop any transaction you do not deem uh, appropriate, which means that you don't have full convertibility. But my point is, I don't think they have in mind a model by which if you are George Soros, you know, you, you, you let the Remin be, I mean, no way. I, I, so what they want is a solution which doesn't go the West in, in the Western way. They want a solution that gives that uh, uh, makes countries use the renminbi, but with the different different rules of the game. In my opinion, yeah. Right now, the of course the rules of the game for the dollar have also changed. So in that sense, the the RMB no longer do, looks that exceptional. Um, I, I, I keep on seeing Yusuf Wanandi on screen, and there's one question out there: is uh, is the G20? 
and Indonesia is the chair of the G20. Can I ask uh, Pawanandi whether whether the G20 is still going to happen, or or is it? Uh, some, well, some 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 mentioned that the G20 might actually be a good way to mediate this crisis, and uh, I think uh, Indonesia actually invited Putin already for October Bali. Uh, so, what do do you have any insights for us, uh, Pavanandi? I think the sleepless nights that they now are having, our foreign ministry people, it might be true. Mm. Uh, what you said, and that is, of course. We just don't know yet. We are still very in a very difficult situation. You have to go on to have a G20. But on the other side, you know, what are the implications in the meantime? So, therefore, you know, that is the big question that we are asking ourselves. I, I I find it may, maybe maybe do first the Bandung conference and then the G20. That would be uh, a good uh, a good, a good way. <laughs> <laughs> we um, all right. I think we are out of questions. Uh, look, this is this is an ongoing debate, and clearly we don't know. There's still many scenarios that can happen in the Ukraine war, even though the downside scenario looks increasingly. Uh, 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 well, is, is becoming more probable, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, but uh, still, as I say, the Vietnam, the Vietnam uh, solution, the China-Vietnam solution, declare victory. That would be a great outcome for 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 the world, because then we can maintain some of the existing international order. It is not going to be easy, and I do think that it will have many economic, as Alicia said, many economic consequences. Before Ukraine, already the February 4th agreement, I think, announced a new phase in the international order, or should I start saying orders, uh, which of course will have its economic consequences over time, uh, almost irrespective of what the outcome of, uh, of the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war uh, uh, will be. With that, I really appreciate Alicia Garcia Rero for uh, getting out here and and you know putting out your thoughts and and that that really requires courage because you know they can't be the final thoughts and they're not uh, 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 and they will be a moving uh, uh, a moving target. Uh, but I'm so glad that you engage on these very difficult questions and that you share your knowledge with so many of us. And clearly, there is a big a big demand for for your insights and for anybody's insights in these matters. So thank you once again very much for coming and thank you everybody for joining this very interesting uh, special seminar. Hi, thank you.